discussing, of course, the FS2 next stage of that FS2 competition, which is to say the um, oral interview, which is going to be recorded, and the uh, written portion as well, which will um, also be on the VidCruder platform. And so what we're going to talk about is the what you should expect, and we're going to talk about how you can approach some of those questions. Okay. Everybody okay with this? Everybody happy? More people are joining. Happy to see you. All right. So first things first, remember that this competition was open to the entire public service of Canada. So there are elements in here, of course, where if you already work for Global Affairs Canada, you have an advantage because you have an, a sense of how the department works and you have a sense of some of the internal workings. But quite frankly, people who come from outside the department um, cannot be uh, disadvantaged compared to people who are inside the department. That's that's not a fair process, right? So because this process is open to the entire public service, what we should expect then is then any information that's provided to you should be something that someone outside should be able to answer equally well, not just somebody inside the department. All right, so that's the first thing to kind of calm yourself about, you know? So even if you don't have the same experience as somebody else at Global Affairs, you should still be able to answer the questions reasonably well, right? Does that, that give anybody kind of, you know, a bit of comfort? Are you happy with this? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So we, because there are a number of people who've never seen the VidCruder platform before, we'll talk about that. But first things first, those of you on the line, have you read your instructions and have you all written back to the uh, email address that was given in your confirmation letter to tell them that yes, you want to continue in the competition. Have you followed all the instructions? <laughs> Make sure, because today's the deadline. And this, there have been some times when other people have been caught out and they've been caught out because they didn't read all of the instructions and they didn't send back in what they were required to and they got knocked out of the competition. Can you imagine that? You know, So that's not a fun way to leave a competition. <laughs> yes, exactly. So thank you so much for adding. You also need to provide your references by today as well. You need to follow the instructions that are in that email, step by step. Oh, hello, unknown participant. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> all right, so if you've all done that, then we can continue. So for those of you who have not seen it before, I, I know just from experience and from talking to other people, what the VidCruder platform is like for the recorded interview. I don't have a good sense of what it's like for the written interview. So you should, if you have questions about that, you should direct them to that same email address where the VidCruder people are running the platform. They can answer any questions that you might have about it. As well, in your instructional um, email, they told you that they're by the 23rd, I believe, is when the platform opens for practice sessions. So I believe at that point, you'll be able to see what the written section looks like, what it's like to do some practice on there. But check with VidCruder and they should be able to tell you on that. But overall, this is what it's like based on our previous experience. They can change it at any time, but so far, this is what we know from what we've seen before. The VidCruder platform works very similar to something like Teams, right? So they give you the link and you log in, and then it's your responsibility, first of all, to make sure that what you present is something reasonable for the person who's going to be looking at it on the other side. So, you know, you make sure that you set up your background so that there's no weird things in there, there's no echoes, no shadows, your voice sounds reasonable. So use that practice time that they give you to make sure that you're present, you're putting your best foot forward because part of how you're being evaluated is how well you communicate. And for instance, if there's all this loud noise crashing in the background, they can't hear you, that will go against you. Right. So make sure that you set up your uh, station in such a way that it's going to be something really attractive for the person who's evaluating you on the other side. And this is what you see. For instance, I'll just stick with the, uh, the recorded interview for now. You can, of course, any time in the window that's given to you. So from the June 23rd to July 7th, you click on the link that brings you to your recorded interview. And you tell them, yes, I want to do the recorded interview at this time. And then it brings you to the first question and it asks you, do you want to do the first question now? And it says, and you say yes. When you say yes, what happens is on your screen will come up the first question. 
the first question at the very top will tell you what competency that question is assessing. So it may say intercultural proficiency, you know, at the top, and then a scenario of some kind. So it'll be a scenario, some hypothetical situation, or it may be, you know, give me an example of a time when you had to deal with an intercultural proficiency issue, or what would you do if you had to do this, blah, 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 something of that nature, right? So they give you some kind of scenario, either from your real life, or they'll give you a scenario that where they present to you the fact scenario, and you have to work with the facts that are given to you in order to try to um, answer the question. So you will have 10 minutes from the time you start the question to write down your notes, to think through the question, to construct your answer, to prepare yourself. If you are finished your preparation before the 10 minutes are up, you can start immediately the second part of the question, which is the answering part, the recorded part. Um, if you're not finished you know, early, that's fine. You can use the entire 10 minutes and the system will automatically throw you into the question after 10 minutes have elapsed. And there's a timer right at the top of the screen as well. So you know how much time is left. Then when you move into the recorded section, essentially you'll just see, you know, the light will go on and will tell you that it's recording and it's your job to just start talking, right? So you'll be talking to your own face. So if you don't like looking at your own face, you need to get used to your own face because you'll be looking at it in order to answer the question, right? Uh, go ahead, question. So Andrea, yes? Yes, actually more a bit of a comment. Um, I have recently done other competitions through the VidCruiter system and one of the last times I noted, um, and you can do this in the practice sessions before you actually kind of launch it, but you can actually put kind of a bit of a filter so you still see yourself, but it's not as clear. Uh, and I found that really helpful because I was really struggling with the fact that all you see uh, when you're answering this question is yourself. And that made me, you know, even more nervous. So instead, I found uh, you can play around with it. I don't have VidCruiter up in front of me, but there's like a little thing over the video where you can kind of blur yourself a bit. And I found that very helpful. So maybe other people can look for that. That's fantastic. That's great information. Thank you, Andrea. Is there somebody else who's gone through it recently? Have any other comments on the VidCruiter system that they can share with the colleagues here? Yeah, if you've noticed anything, anything that was really helpful or or off-putting, please go ahead and share. <laughs> That's great. Go ahead, Susan. Um, hi, uh, I uh, I was in the FS1 competition uh, recently, and I found uh, at least from my PC, um, it was hard for them to pick up my voice. So. I say um, uh, do the, uh, you, you can already uh, test your device to see if uh, your video uh, works well and your sound. And if it turns out that uh, the computer is saying, keeps telling you that it's not within range, then it's a good idea to contact the cooter uh, even before this Wednesday to try to test it out with them and see uh, what you can do. Then sometimes it's a, a change of browsers and sometimes you really need to uh, uh, make some changes to your settings. So best to do that, not on the day of your exam. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent <laughs> advice. Excellent <laughs> advice. Please use those practice sessions that they allow you. Please make use of them as Susan is saying and, and as Andrea is saying, you know, make sure that you set it up in such a way that it really puts your best foot forward and it doesn't freak you out and whatnot. As a question from Nuhead and then a couple of hands up. Nuhead asks, um, can we record ourselves for a second time or we only have one chance to record? Once you're in the exam, you have one shot. That's your 10 minutes and that's it for that one question. Once you've recorded it, you can't go back to it, right? We're gonna talk a bit about strategies around you know, how to make use of that 10 minutes preparation time. And we're certainly gonna talk about how you can structure your answers later on in this session. We'll get to that as well, but that's your one shot. And what's happened in the past, and people who have done it more recently can speak to this. Um, once you go through the first question, um, the experience that we've seen before is that you the system prompts you, said, do you want to go on to the second question? And it's not automatically pushing you forward to the second question. Was that the experience of people who have done it very recently? Did the system allow you to kind of take a break between questions and you know get some water or something like that? Or did it push you automatically to the next question? 
Yes, you had you had a break between the questions. You could like go to the bathroom or yeah, yes. Yeah. So even though it says 80 minutes, you don't necessarily have to just sit there for 80 minutes straight. It's more you sit for 20 minutes, do the first question, and then if you want to take a break, you can, and then come back to it. The one thing that it would caution you is make sure your system doesn't crash <laughs> while you're taking your break because you have to be connected to the VidCruder system for the whole time, apparently. That's that's some of the information that we've gotten from VidCruder. So how long is the break? As long as your system is connected to VidCruder platform. <laughs> take, a, take a nap. <laughs> because of course you can't see the subsequent questions, right? You you there's you don't have an advantage that way. It just, you know, if you feel that you just need a break or if you have say small children or animals or something like that that need attention, like you can attend to them and then come back and do the second question and the third and the fourth in the same manner. In addition, the VidCruder platform has advised you that you don't necessarily have to do the written in test part at the same time that you do the oral exam part. You can do those separately. What exactly that means, you have to check with VidCruder. Does that mean you can do them on two different days? I'm not sure. So I would ask you to check with VidCruder for that. Okay, so there were some hands up. We'll go through those in order. Okay, Anik, and then Philippe, and then Andrea. Yes, hi, yes, CJ. Thank you for um, organizing this. Uh, so in terms of things that I found useful, I, I recently did a competition using the platform. Um, yes, absolutely use the uh, practice question. Do it as many times as it, it is given to you just to be comfortable be in, the, in the platform and seeing yourself on screen. Uh, and also, if you have time, try and practice to get an idea what those like an eight minute looks like, um, like beforehand. Don't wait during the exam to find out what eight minutes looks like because it will just make you panic more. So <laughs> if it says you have eight minutes to answer a question or to prep, just do it before so you have an idea because that's the thing that's that uh really screwed me over last time because i was <laughs> i was i was watching the i was watching the clock go go down and i was like oh my god seven minutes five minutes and then it gets to two minutes and then total panic so that's my advice for this morning <laughs> we're gonna practice some of that managing time as well don't worry as we go through these sessions this week so we'll talk about that as well but that's excellent advice <laughs> all right I believe uh, Philip was next. Hello, thanks CJ for organizing this um, again. Um, there's a mention, there's a note about AirPods. Uh, does anyone know why we there's a um, there's a notice against using using them? I don't know. Maybe they don't work because I don't. I don't know. To me, they're just fantastic. I used them for another process in last July, and it was great. So. Um, I don't, I don't know. know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It's something. It must be something technical. It must be something technical. Okay. Okay. Um, go ahead, Andrea. You don't have any doors for the FS interviews. As far as I understand, there isn't. As far as I understand, it's one shot to record your your one answer, because if you had the chance, you can re-record your practice. You know, you have your practice. You can re-record those as many times as you like. But the actual test itself, is like, it's like you have one shot and that's it, 10 minutes, as far as I understand. Again, check with VidCruder in case that has changed, but I don't believe it's the case. Okay, any other questions at this stage? Any other comments or any other questions about the platform itself? Okay, going once, going twice. Three times and it's gone. Okay, excellent. We can move on then to talking about the competencies because this is what's being assessed in this, um, this stage of the competition. So you've all seen your sheet and you see that there are a number of competencies listed. And then it's an ability to, what is it, express yourself orally. And then a couple more competencies are listed. And then it says ability to express yourself in writing. That suggests to me not know for sure, but it suggests to me that those elements that are listed above ability to access, express yourself orally, that those are what are being assessed on the oral part of the exam. And the ones that are listed above ability to express yourself in writing are the ones being assessed in the writing section. That's a suggestion. That's what I would infer from that wording, the way that those uh, competencies are laid out. But do not take that as gospel. 
if anything, you can ask HR to say, look, you know, what, what's the story here? I need, I need to prepare. So can you give us some more information on that? And HR can confirm one way or another. Okay. Yeah, so there's a um, note in the chat saying that you there was an email that went around a few days ago saying VidCruder is now compatible with Global Affairs Canada issued laptops, whereas before you had to use a personal computer. Did anyone else get that email? I have also heard this from other people, so it appears to be this um, that appears to be true. Again, to confirm for for absolute for sure, you know, if you haven't gotten that email, send an email to VidCruder and ask them if you can use it. And then as well, what you can do is check during the practice sessions you're allowed to do on BidCruder. You can go on there and see if it works with your, your Global Affairs Canada laptop. Okay, so everyone have the competencies. Does everybody know what they are? Anyone know where to find them? <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly so. Now, again, remember I said, this is a competition that's open to the entire public service of Canada. Therefore, the definitions of these competencies have to be open to everybody who's in the public service. They cannot be just open to Global Affairs Canada employees. They cannot just be what's housed on our intranet. So I've done some digging and I've not been able to find where these competencies, the open ones, the ones that are open to the entire public service. I don't know where they're housed. So what I would suggest is that you ask HR, you ask um, that uh, website, that um, email address, that's the FS2 competition that's at the bottom of the job poster, say, look, where are the competency definitions? You know, because everybody has to be on the same footing. So everybody has to be working off the same definitions. However, while you're asking that question of HR and while they're coming to you with the answer, what we can do in this session is look at the competency dictionary that is on the Global Affairs Canada um, intranet, and that covers four of the competencies that are listed in this stage of the competition. What I'm going to do is pull that up now so that you can see it, and I'll share my screen. So I'll just go right to the top here of the competency dictionary, and I'll just share my screen. Let me know if you have any problems seeing my screen. Competency dictionary here. Okay. Anyone have any trouble seeing my screen? Okay. So here we are. This is a Global Affairs Canada competency based approach, competency dictionary. Here's the table of contents. And what I'll do is I'll just pull up here is where you see, you can see here. Global Affairs Canada, core international behavioral competencies, intercultural proficiency, influencing and alliance building, judgment within a global context, resilience and adaptability. So those are four that are listed on your sheet. You'll notice that they, they, those same competencies come up again, but notice the level. Here it's for EX level competitions, here it's for head of mission competitions. So you don't need to worry about that. It's these ones here that you need to worry about. Now, I understand the text is kind of small, so what I'll do is I'll read out just the top definition and we'll look at how this competency is laid out. Okay, so here for intercultural proficiency, the top definition here across the top says, employees at Global Affairs Canada show an astute awareness um, of their cultural surroundings, as well as personal assumptions and thoughts regarding those surroundings. They use culturally specific knowledge to behave in a way that is appropriate and effective in a foreign environment. They navigate across cultural contexts to engender awareness of Canadian values and to achieve outcomes for Canada. The intercultural um, proficient employee possesses self-knowledge, sensitivity, modesty, and respect regarding other cultures and their own. They also understand and work with cultural differences and are able to include them in the workplace and in the organizational processes. In this table, you'll note that it goes, of course, one, two, three, four. As you move from left to right, you see that the person actually has more and more capabilities in this competency. So one is kind of a basic level, two will be more proficient, three more proficient, four more proficient. And then as you move up to four, you'll notice that there are some expectations about working with a team, managing a team. 
So it's a bit simplistic to say that one corresponds to FS1, two to FS2, three to FS3, and four to FS4, but that is kind of the progression here. So as you're answering the question, and if this is the layout of the competency, then for sure you would need at least to be able to say that you demonstrate this at the two level, no lower than two. If you can demonstrate higher than two, perfect, but certainly no lower than two. So those would be the elements of the competency that you would focus on to say, okay, when I'm answering that question on intercultural proficiency, it's the points that are listed there under one and two that I need to be able to show that I've mastered or that I would employ in order to um, really get the points necessary for that competency. Does that make sense? Are people clear on that? Okay, what I'll do is I'll continue with the rest of the, the other three competencies that are here, and then I'll share some other ones that I found. Okay, here's influencing and alliance building. Again, I'll read out the um, definition at the top. Employees at Global Affairs Canada identify shared interests. This is influencing and alliance building. Um, identify shared interests, both na nationally and internationally, and cultivate them to persuade others. They know whose interests are at play and leverage those interests in Canada's favor. They think things through from the perspective of others and anticipate what they may need to support a position or accomplish a goal. They reach out to people and partners who could be of value to Canada regarding issues, both country specific and global. They establish networks to gather insights and expand their sphere of influence. They collaborate with players who are diverse and dissimilar from themselves, including countries, non-governmental organizations, private sector, and cultural communities. And again, you would be focusing here on that second column at least and seeing if you could pull in anything from a, a higher column. The reason you wouldn't necessarily want everything from the higher column is that remember that you're answering the, perspective, the question from the perspective of an FS2 officer. And most FS2 officers are not managing whole teams. You may have a, one or a few people reporting to you, normally assistants or students or something of that nature, but normally you're not a program manager at the FS2 level, right? So you wouldn't have a whole team of people um, reporting to you. Similarly, at um, headquarters, you wouldn't necessarily be a deputy director or a, dep or a director at an FS2 level. You would be reporting to a deputy director or reporting to a director you'd be part of their team. The third um, competency that's found in this dictionary that's on your test is judgment within a global context. Employees at Global Affairs Canada make well-founded decisions based on the priorities and values of the organization and identify shared interests, both nationally and internationally, and cultivate them to persuade others. They anticipate how decisions will be received across Canada and internationally, and adapt their strategies and interactions with international parties accordingly. Global Affairs Canada's international context requires working in the face of uncertainty and incomplete information, assessing risks, and identifying workable options. They are aware of sensitivities and know when and how to act in order to resonate with others. They know what can be realistically done. And then finally, we have resilience and adaptability. Employees at Global Affairs Canada maintain a constructive problem-solving approach in environments that are unpredictable and culturally challenging. They adapt readily to change and maintain focus and optimism in the face of tasks that make personal, emotional, and physical demands. They remain calm and resourceful in a crisis. They recover quickly from setbacks and adapt strategies to address them. They seek creative solutions and they adapt personally and professionally to the conditions and challenges of living and working with other cultures. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back here to the session. Okay, so you'll see now in the chat that people have shared the internal link for the competency dictionary. The competency dictionary is quite large. What we can do actually, if somebody can just um, do a PDF print of just those pages, I'll do it myself as well. And I'll try to share it um, as a file in, this, um, in the files for this particular chat. So at least you'll get those pages. But again, HR has to provide this to you. You know, you can't be walking into this blind, you need that. There are some other um, particular 
competencies that are not in that competency dictionary, but I was digging around and said, okay, well, this looks like something useful. Here, for instance, I'll put it in the chat. One of the things that you need to um, have a really good handle on would be our the departmental plan, the 2020-2021 departmental plan of Global Affairs Canada, which is on a website that is open to the public. So I've put the link there in the chat. Yes, there is a French version of that PDF document. What I'm going to do here is pull the doc. I'm going to see if I can actually put the competency dictionary. I have a PDF, two PDF copies on my um, desktop here, but I'm going to see if I can put it. It might not accept it because it's quite large. Okay, any other questions about that while I'm pulling up documents here? Uh, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is uh, Mundele. So my question is, um, because we don't know the nature of, of the questions, um, so how would we match, um, I mean, any different scenario to these competencies? So I, I don't oh, know how, oh. yeah. We're going to talk about that in a second, don't worry. Okay, thank you. So Sorry, I'm just pulling up one other. Um, analytical thinking was also something that's being assessed, and I couldn't find anything on analytical thinking on our intranet, but I did find um, analytical thinking on the National Research Council of Canada, and I've put the links there in English and French, and that outlines, generally speaking, analytical thinking is kind of consistent across the government, so you can um, look at that table and have a look at how, what they mean when they say, well, how do you how do you think things through analytically? Like, what, how does that work? Which HR in, um, email should you ask questions about the competencies to? You should ask at the one that is listed on the job poster. Any question about the competencies, about the process, you can ask um, HR at that FS2 um, email that's given on your job poster. You should all have a copy of that job poster considering that you applied for this. Yes, competition. So you should you should still have that job poster. Yes, and that is the um, contact email for the department. Hi, Bez. Welcome. Hi. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> no problem. So we're just going through competencies at the moment. And so what I would ask is that any you or you or any other mentors who have jumped in on the line that I haven't seen. Please, please feel free to jump in and supplement anything that I'm saying or, or contradict me if you find I'm wrong. <laughs> we can talk about it. All right. Okay, so the couple of links. Let's talk about the links that I've posted and then we can start getting into what the questions actually start to look like. And we'll um, put an example up and we'll start working through that example and you'll see how this works, right? Okay, so first, the first link that I put up is to the departmental plan. You'll see it's a www.international.gc.ca address. And that is um, where you have to demonstrate you have knowledge of the department's priorities. So knowledge of the department's priorities are found in the 2020-2021 departmental plan. And that is a very long document. You're not expected to memorize that or know it completely in depth. What you're expected to draw from that is an understanding of what the department does, where is it focused, what kind of impact are we trying to have, why do we exist, you know, as a department. That's more that kind of good understanding because everything flows from all of our, our overall mandate, then to our planning, then to our different streams and our different sections, and then down to the FS2s, right, and FS1s and everybody who works at the department. So everybody who works in the department has a role to play. And the role that we play rolls right back up into that plan, right? It's all of us working together that make that plan come to fruition. So that's why they ask you to have a knowledge of what that plan is and your understanding of your place in it, right? Do you understand? Anyone have any questions about the departmental plan? Okay, good. No questions about that. The next two that I posted there, they are websites that say nrc.canada.ca. So it's English and French, and those are links to analytical thinking. Again, it's a table, has five sections, and it just lays out from simplest to most complex, what does it mean to demonstrate analytical thinking? 
So that gives you an idea of what they might be looking for in that competency as you're going through your own preparation. Right? That might be something they assess more um, to say, do you use analytical thinking when you're approaching the question, right? As opposed to, I demonstrate analytical thinking every day in my job, right? So just read that through and just think that, think it through and keep it in the back of your mind as you go through. Okay. Are there any questions about the competencies that are being assessed? Remember that the competency that's being assessed in a particular question will be listed at the top. So even though you may get a fact scenario, you may go to question that you could attack from different angles or from different competencies, the one that's being assessed is the one that's listed at the top or, or the two that's listed at the top. They could assess two competencies in one, right? So make sure you focus your answer on that. Okay, our next step then in this session is to um, bring up a sample question. This is not anything from HR. This is actually a question made up by our good friend in Bangkok, Stuart Shaw. And what we can do is pull it up and uh, put it into the chat. And then you now need to start volunteering to answer some of these, some of the aspects of that question, right? And we'll talk about how you do that as we go through for the rest of this session. What I would say is that uh, need some volunteers. So don't be shy. Put your hands up if you're interested. Do you want to see the question first before you volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pull it up now. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. I've posted the question in the chat. You'll see at the top, it is um, based on the intercultural proficiency competency. Here's a question, I'll read it out for those of you who may have trouble. You recently arrived at POST and you are assigned to develop and deliver an advocacy plan on a difficult but important issue for Canada. The task is particularly difficult because you are working in a new and unfamiliar culture that seems unfriendly. Furthermore, Canada's position on the issue you are working on is raising cultural objections from the local population. How would you analyze the situation and develop an approach? How would you overcome cultural challenges of working in the difficult situation? How would you advocate for Canada's position? So there are often times when questions are phrased in this way. There's information given to you in a hypothetical situation like this but there's a lot that's left unsaid. And then there's some information there that you have to address, right? You are asked certain questions in, in the scenario. You have to address those questions. There's no option, uh, but you have some leaders. So we're gonna talk about how you structure your answers. But go ahead. You can't see the question? Is anyone well, else having to see the question? Can't, yeah, we can't see the question, sorry. Okay. Yeah, see no, can't can you see, see it, it now? No. Or can you see it now? No, is I think right? you are sharing. Yes, sharing yes, we can, we there can it see is. it now. <laughs> there it's now. All right, so there now. So while you're reading the question again, I'm going to pull up the competency dictionary, and I'm going to look at the um, second column under intercultural proficiency. I'm just going to read out some of the things that are there. Okay, so under the intercultural um, proficiency definition, under that second column, it says you're able to identify and describe your own cultural assumptions and biases and your possible impact on your work. You identify strategies to maintain cultural differences between personal beliefs and what needs to be put in place at the professional level. You model Canadian value, values while respecting the norms and behaviors of other cultures. You accommodate local behavior that conflicts with your personal beliefs and values without judging or protesting. You ensure that the needs and work methods CBS and LES properly reflect Global Affairs Canada's guidelines of intercultural effectiveness in the workplace. 
You engage LES and coworkers to explore respective objectives, concerns, and interests. You contribute to team cohesiveness in a way that is appropriate to the culture. And you validate your approach and behaviors by seeking feedback in intercultural environments. So those are the bullet points under intercultural proficiency. So there's the definition and then there are the bullet points in that second column. All right, so normally the way to approach these questions is that you have to approach it with some kind of structure. That's the main thing, you have to structure your answer. You don't just start answering, right? You have to structure your answer. And how many people on the line are familiar with the STAR format of answering questions of this nature? Please put your hand if you've heard of the STAR format. Tell us, tell us, anyone else? All right, those of you who are brave to put your hand up and say you know what it is, now you have to explain it. Come, tell us, tell us what it is. Hi, this is Mike uh, jumping in. So it's um, a manner in which to structure your answer and STAR stands for um, situation, task, action, and result. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. focusing on your specific role uh, in each of those categories when structuring your answer. Oh, very good. Does that make sense to everybody? Would you like to hear an example of how it works? Yes. OK, so those of you who know how it works, come give an example. How does it work? Something pick something very simple. Come, give an example, and then we'll apply it to this, this practice question. Go ahead, Andrea. Sure, I'm just making this one up uh, on the fly, but let's say the, the situation, I would say um, uh, working as a policy analyst for X team, uh, you know, for X amount of time, I uh, had to uh, create a briefing note for the ADM, so that's a task. Um, then the action is that I consulted with colleagues within the department, specialists on the specific theme for the briefing note, and I um, also ensured adequate timelines in order to seek approvals for this uh, briefing note. As a result, the ADM was, was adequately prepared for their meeting, and they were able to uh, advocate several of Canada's interests or key interests, something like that. So that's... Hey, well done. So does everybody who is not familiar with that format, do you understand how it works? Situation, tâche, action, résultat, situation, task, action, results. So this is what we suggest that you, it's one framework. You, I mean, there are other ways that you can arrange your answers, but this is just one format, right? That works fairly well because it helps you, first of all, think about the situation in which you're in. You focus on the question that you're being given and what's your role within that question? Who are you and what are you doing? What's what's expected of you, right? So you summarize that at the very top. Um, you also add in any assumptions that you may be making as well as you're answering the question. And we'll get to that in a second, what that looks like. Then you talk about the specific task that you have to accomplish and the tasks that you have, have to accomplish are normally listed right in the question. Right, wherever you're asked a question, normally it's it's about a task that you have to accomplish. Then you talk about what it is that you would do to accomplish those tasks. What action would you take, right? And we'll talk about signposting in a minute, how, how you talk about the action you would take. And then at the end, you kind of summarize, say, look, after doing all of that, what I would expect is this result. And the result ties back into who you are and what you're seeking to accomplish overall as an FS2 officer. You see, so that's how you would move through the STAR uh, process for um, a question. Now, I said a couple of things. One, I said that you have to make some assumptions. There's always a gap of information in the question. There are some gaps. You can assume, make some assumptions that are useful to you. For instance, in this example that was given, you are at post. But what does it not tell you? It doesn't tell you what stream you're in, for instance. Are you an MCO? Are you a political officer? Are you a trade officer? Are you a public safety officer? Are you an IRCC officer? Like, what are you? It doesn't say, right? So in this case, if you have experience in a certain stream, 
that fits the parameters of the question. You can say, well, I assume that for the purpose of this question, that I'm in this stream, the one that is most familiar to you, right? That's an assumption you can make, right? So wherever you can make an assumption that is helpful to you, please go ahead and do it, but state your assumption right off the top, right? However, do not assume away things that are the heart of the question. You cannot assume things that away things that are the heart of the question, which is to say, if the heart of the question is, um, there's a conflict at work, and you're trying to manage a conflict at work between two coworkers, you can't make the assumption that you, the two workers have gotten, have had a heart to heart and they've, they're all getting along wonderfully now. That's, that's not an assumption you can make, right? The task in that particular question is, how do you resolve a conflict, right? So you can't assume away something that goes to the heart of the question. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right, so who wants to take a stab at this question? Who wants to at least look at it and see what jumps out at you? So we won't answer it just yet, but let's see what, what are the issues that you see that jump out at you? Who wants to be? Come, come, hands up, you have to do it. Go ahead, okay. um, Hi, thank you uh, for organizing the session again. First of all, it's always lovely um, with your um, wonderful spirit. The first thing that jumps out at me basically is the fact that there's several questions, so we need to be aware and not um, like what I would do is probably jot down when I'm prepping um, to make sure that I answer all of them. So that would be one tip that I would um, provide because that's something I see right away. Excellent. What else jumps out? Hands up. What else jumps out at you? What else do you see? Do you see? Yeah, Go ahead, Susan. So I see a list of challenges. Um, so I would start jotting down what they are. So for example, being new and then two, um, the advocacy is difficult and uh, that it may it, we're in a country that has very unfamiliar culture, so they may, they probably do not see this share the same value. So uh, I, I think um, we think of plans to make sure that we can work together later. Okay, so a couple yeah. of these things are pulled out. What else jumps out at people? What else do you see that for sure you would probably want to address? Go ahead. Um, I was just thinking about sort of the different different levels, internal and external, not reinventing the wheel. So just thinking about all the different people I would need to um, talk to, uh, all the documents I would want to consult in terms of how, you know, um, how Canada has established itself, uh, for, you know, with regards to that issue. But then internally with uh, locally engaged staff, of course, would be a, a critical component. Um, to sort of understand the lay of the land, uh, but then externally, um, you uh, you know, I'd want to consult with uh, partners that may be involved um, in this issue that we have engaged prior. Like again, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So the whole effort of really getting a lay of the land. What have we said before? Where are we? Who are our allies? Who you know have we engaged with up to this point? Um, and then taking it from there and then but then, uh, you know, being um, very communicate communicative with the manager. So making sure you're not just running off and, and making, you know, sort of uh, running here, there and everywhere, but making sure at every stage that you're consulting with your manager. So you're on track. They're in agreement. You're not reinventing the wheel. So that would be my first kind of um, approach in then developing a strategy. Hmm, very good. Okay, anything else anybody wants to comment on? Because then we're going to talk about structuring your answer here. Because you've all raised some very good things. And we're going to talk about strategy of how you use your preparation time. Does that make sense? So Any other comments? Go ahead. Something something else, uh, it's more of a question. The um, sentence says, uh, the task is particularly difficult because you're working in a new and unfamiliar culture that seems friendly. So. Do we, that seems unfriendly. Yes, <laughs> sorry. So it kind of seems like it's 
disappointing you to jump to a conclusion and I don't know if that's a trap uh, when should we try to first um, verify this assumption or we just assume that it is and it's verified. Excellent, excellent. I loved all of these points that you've raised and I'm sure that your colleagues on the line like them as well. So when you first get the question, it'll be like this, you know, it'll, it'll tell you the competency at the top, the question will be on the screen, the timer will be there panicking you, you know, oh, time's running out. The first thing to do is to just read the question and just jot down all of the things that come to mind. In the past, when VidCruiter platform um, interviews, they have told us that you're not allowed to bring in external papers. So you can't bring the competency dictionary with you. You can't bring the definition with you. So you have to essentially go through those competencies and essentially make for yourself some mnemonic device, some way of remembering key words, key phrases out of the definitions so that when you get to the particular competency that's being assessed, you say to yourself, oh yes, intercultural proficiency, it means you know, respect for other cultures and it means Canadian values as well. And it means, you know, whatever language is in the, the dictionary or whatever language is in the definition that you receive, right? So that's the first thing that you write down when you're preparing in your 10 minute window. The second thing that you do is you note down all the things that jump out at you at the question. These are the things I have to make sure to address. Do not start answering the question yet. What you're doing is noting the things that immediately come to mind, because those are probably going to be the heart of the question. Those are probably going to be the most important things that you're going to want to make sure to craft into your answer, right? So you do this immediately, and you know, oh, you're in a bit of a panic. You're jotting all this stuff down. You're jotting down the things you need to remember from the, the dictionary, from the competency definition, and you're jotting down the things from the question. And then you will have the urge to immediately start crafting your answer. I am telling you to resist that urge. What you should do at that point is go back and read the question again. Read it carefully, read it slowly, read it out loud, do whatever you need to do to read it carefully. And this is what we're going to do now because on the second read through, you will catch things that you didn't see before. You will notice nuances you didn't notice before. And that will help you to say, okay, what is it that I need to do here? First things first, remember, a lot of these scenarios that they put in front of you can be answered from different perspectives. But what's the perspective of this question? It's intercultural proficiency. That's what's being evaluated. Nothing else is really being assessed here. So you have to answer the question from that perspective, right? So let's read it again. You recently arrived at post. Did they tell you what post it is? No, so you don't know. And again, that's probably very deliberate because in this particular question, they don't want you to get hung up on which part of the world you're in, right? It could be anywhere. Should you assume a particular place? In an intercultural proficiency question, I, I would doubt it. I would say leave it out most likely, right? But you're recently arrived at post. It does not tell you as well, how big a post it is. Is it a small mission? Is it a huge mission? You don't know. As you go through the question, it might be useful for you to assume one or the other, right? But let's go through the question and we'll see what, what the question reveals to us. You are assigned to develop and deliver an advocacy plan on a difficult but important issue for Canada. So this is a challenging issue for Canada. Somehow it's difficult, and somehow it's important. So important in what way? Perhaps it's connected to some of our departmental priorities, right? It's connected to the um, national government's priorities, right? So you need to develop an advocacy plan. So you are going to be what? Presenting Canada's point of view on this issue. And it's a tricky one, right? And it's a tricky one probably because you're running into some cross-cultural issues, most likely, yes? This is something that you could start saying at the beginning of your answer to say, well, just from reading the question, this is my understanding. I am going to answer the question from this perspective, right? That's how you state your assumptions up front. Let's keep reading. The task is particularly difficult because you are working in a new and unfamiliar culture that seems unfriendly. And as you has pointed out, 
the culture seems unfriendly. The question does not tell you that the culture is unfriendly. It says that it seems unfriendly. So how much of this is indeed your own perception and how much of it is indeed just a clash of cultures? Some, what if it, how much of it is external to you and how much of it is internal? Right? You have to think that through. That's part of the heart of the question, right? Okay, keep going. Furthermore, so on top of that, on top of that, Canada's position on this issue you are working on is raising cultural objections from the local population. Well, who's the local population? Notice it doesn't say. Is it people who are external to the mission only? Is it, you know, NGOs? Is it, you know, local, you know, cultural groups? Is it local politicians? Is it internal to the mission? Is it your locally engaged staff? Are they upset about this? The, the, the question doesn't say, right? So these are things, you, these are nuances that as you feel your way through the question, you're going to have to think about how you answer, right? And so Canada's position on the issue you're working on is raising cultural objections. So Canada has already an established position on this issue, whatever it is, and it's your job to advocate Canada's position, right? Let's keep going. How would you analyze the situation and develop an approach? How would you overcome cultural challenges of working in a difficult situation? And how would you advocate for Canada's position? It's one, two, three. The first is from an intercultural proficiency standpoint. How would you analyze the situation and develop an approach? How do you overcome the cultural challenges that you yourself are facing working in this environment? And then how do you actually advocate for Canada's position? Do you see there are three things there? Any questions so far on how we're looking at this question? wants to take a stab at let's say the first part of the, the first question there go ahead susan actually uh, it's more than for the third part um sure. would the last part how would you advocate for canada's position would that be a good opportunity for you to throw out the uh, departmental plan like the four priorities or is it's, it is this too short a time frame to work on that because uh, there are lots of sub questions in this one uh, scenario, and uh, it's uh, we may run out of time if we want to cover the four priorities and how they would um, um, match. If you're expected to address um, knowledge of the department, normally it would be listed. It would say knowledge of the department is is what's being assessed here, right? Okay. It's, and, it's never. Uh, it's always handy to know what the departmental priorities are. But again, the question is not giving you much information here on what the issue is, right? So it's kind of hard to know which priority you're leaning on if you and, don't know what the specific issue is. And, right? and, and for, for this question, it's kind of vague. So I don't know like what, like for this particular culture, what part it is against Canada's position and what position we're talking about. Precisely so. so that's hard to answer <laughs> if we don't really know what they're talking about <laughs> exactly so but it's like these things well, are what doing. are we solving because i don't know what the problem is <laughs> exact again remember you're not here to actually develop a plan <laughs> you're here to answer do you have in, are you proficient in intercultural relations as an fs2 officer that's what's being assessed right it's not, not a plan on any particular issue. You're not here. They're not looking to you to solve a problem somewhere in the, you know, some other country where we, you know, we have some challenge with um, another part of the world. <laughs> What's yours? Do you understand what your role is an FS2 officer? Go ahead, Eve. Um, yeah, to your, to your point. So they say, how would you analyze the situation, which is exactly what we're discussing? and develop an approach. So I'm just wondering how much weight would we give to the approach that we develop or it's more in the how do we approach the development? And number and number two, what I what I was um, sort of uh, warned by a friend, don't long, uh, how much um, 
time do we give to this reminds me of a time when I did that very well, mm. you know, previous. So I was sort of told in the situational analysis, don't launch into um, previous, uh, you know, what, um, you know, things that you did um, to kind of prove that you're able to do it. You just focus on what you would do. So is there is there room for I did that very well when X, Y and Z? Sure. OK, well, why don't we start with this? I'll answer one of the questions and give you just a kind of a brief answer and you see how you might approach something like this, right? So you'd say, okay. Um, just answering the question alone, I'm gonna leave out the situation and the task. I'm just gonna talk about the action, that, that section in the star. Okay, so the question I'm answering is, how I would analyze the situation and develop an approach? Well, in this context, I wanna be really sensitive to the fact that this issue is one that's probably raising some tensions between um, the Canada-based staff who share certain values and some of the locally engaged staff who probably share some other values. Plus there's pressure most likely coming from outside the mission as well because the question tells me that this issue is causing some consternation among local populations. And I'm presuming that this includes both people within the mission and people outside of it. So the way in which I would analyze this situation is to try to canvas opinion from as many different sources as possible so that I make sure that I'm culturally sensitive, even as I work towards advocating Canada's position. So the way to do that, in my view, would be to talk to the CBS and the LES in the mission first, who have opinions and knowledge of this issue, to find out where they stand and where the cultural sensitivities lie. So I would have meetings with different people within the mission to help me understand what the situation is. What I'll, the other thing I would do to analyze the situation and to develop my approach would be to read the local press and listen to local media to find out what the local population is saying about Canada's position. The other thing I would do is I would remember that I'm newly arrived at post. I'm going to assume for the purposes of this question that I'm not the first person to hold this position. So what I would do is contact my predecessor at this post and find out what my predecessor did on this file and what advice they have for me on this particular issue and about any kind of intercultural tensions between uh, Canada's position and the local position on this issue. And that was what would help me analyze the situation, step back from it and understand where people are having challenges with what Canada is advocating and with what the local um, population would like to see. And it's from there that I would develop my approach. I would try to find a middle way between any kind of extremes. And if my predecessor and my supervisor tell me that there are certain things that have worked in the past, I would try to adopt some of those same practices so as to make sure I continue doing the good work that has already been established at the mission on this file. Do you see? Do you see how yeah. that works? Yeah. Yes. And I'm assuming we wouldn't provide ourselves additional complexities in saying, what if there was tensions between the CBS um, opinions and the LES positions? Because it is controversial and we may have different values and assumptions. I'm, I'm assuming we wouldn't do that to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to make assumptions, easy. don't assume things that are going to make your life difficult, right? <laughs> <laughs> You may want you may want to touch on them. You yeah. may want to touch on to say you know there may be tensions, but don't assume them for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know the CBS and the LES are at war. I'm assuming that they don't talk to each other at all, and they hate each other. So or, or, at least, or how we how we acknowledge our own cultural bias. I guess that would be a really good one to to sort of weave in there. Exactly. How how are we able? Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. who wants Thanks. who wants to uh, tackle the second question? How would you overcome? cultural challenges of working in the difficult situation? Because this one is more about you, right? If you read that part of the question carefully, this is more about the challenge that you are facing going into what had the, the question has told you is new, unfamiliar, and something that seems to you to be unfriendly, right? Who wants to take a shot? Come, be brave, be brave. Ah, go ahead, Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Okay, 
<laughs> so, um, and you gave such a great model, so I'm going to try and uh, do what you've model what you, the behavior you've suggested by, you know, putting my assumptions up there first and, and then going from there. So the question, how would you overcome cult cultural challenges of working in the difficult situation? Um, so I guess um, the first assumption I uh, would make about this is um, given that uh, they're saying that uh, the cultural challenge and difficult situation, I assume that I am feeling a bit uncomfortable uh, in this situation being new. Uh, perhaps it might be uh, one of uh, the first times I'm in perhaps a posting of um, this complexity. Um, and so um, it is an unfamiliar situation that I that I haven't experienced. Um, so my first um, approach would be, I guess, to check my assumptions. Um, and again, I would do this by, uh, you know, just trying to understand what is the actual uh, context, uh, wh what is uh, the, the actual situation. Speaking, I think, to my colleagues in post, uh, particularly the LES, I think would be a great place to start because um, presumably they have worked with many, many, many CBS over the years and perhaps they might understand uh, some of the challenges that new CBS uh, coming into post uh, experience. Um, I would again perhaps reach out to, to my manager and to uh, my predecessor to just understand, you know, were these same challenges that I'm facing, were they uh, things that they felt when they first arrived at post? Um, am I in line with kind of some of these feelings. Um, I would, you know, again, read uh, not just the media, but probably a lot of social media groups. Um, you know, perhaps there's um, other, there's expat groups or there's, you know, different organizations uh, within the country that you can reach out to to, again, get an idea of what is the actual situation. Um, and then in terms of, you know, overcoming the the challenges of working uh, in this situation, I mean, um, the I'm assuming the, the 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 question mentions the unfriendliness. The country seems unfriendly. So what exact? I would ask myself, what exactly is it that I'm uh, associating with unfriendly? Is it perhaps a manner of speaking? Uh, is it that perhaps the culture is uh, more formal or more um, hierarchical? That I'm experiencing in Canada. Um, you know, what what are these elements? Really breaking it down. What what is it that I feel like is uh, is unfamiliar or, or unfriendly? And um, really, again, challenge these assumptions and and try and come up with uh, areas where we align. I'm of course, there's no. I don't think there's any country where we're absolutely going to say, you know, this is black, this is white. We can never get along on anything. Of course, there's going to be areas. Uh, of course, that that you know. There's going to be similarities, and there's going to be things that I can uh, get in line, um, get aligned on. So probably seek those out. Where where are uh, our similarities? Where are the areas that you know are perhaps um, uh, situations I'm more familiar with, and kind of try and and uh, focus on those rather than focus on um, the challenges, perhaps. Hmm. Very good. Anybody have any comments for Alexandra on her, her attempt at this? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what did you like? What did you dislike? What would you add? What would you take away? Go ahead, Andrea. Uh, yeah, excellent job, Alexandra. Um, I I think you were really taking that question for for what it was and 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 checking your own uh, assumptions. And so I think that that was uh, really great. And um, I think one thing when when I thought of this question, it just goes to show how people react to questions like this differently. The first thing that came to mind for me would be that my assumption is that the the local language is not English or French, and so perhaps some of this what I'm perceiving as being unfriendly is linked to a lack of uh, understanding. So one of the ways that I could overcome uh, cultural challenges of working in the situation would be to uh, try and hone in as well my, my language skills. So that could be even taking uh, courses in the local language, trying to improve. I mean, even if that was done before then, uh, just trying to uh, practice and see if, um, you know, when we're talking about it being unfriendly, um, we're the newcomers. So it's, it's ultimately, you know, it's also up to us as well. We have to 
to meet people where we're at, which is what you you were saying, Alexandra, but also make that effort to to be friendly and check in with uh, with your LES and say, you know, let's say you have an idea about how to um, gain, you know, build rapport with, with colleagues, uh, see if that is appropriate in the context. Maybe that means going for coffee with colleagues. Maybe that means, um, you know, a housewarming party, or maybe it means uh, just, you know, having a conversation. It could mean a number of different things, but uh, yeah, I thought your uh, answer was really great to Alexandra, thanks. Go ahead, Eve. Um, <clears throat> yeah, something something just dawned on me. Um, what are we trying to achieve? So what are the what are, what is what's the purpose of this advocacy, this plan that we're developing? What are the outcomes we're looking for? Um, wh who's the demographic? Are we looking to reach out to youth? Are we looking to reach out? You know, are we thinking at the political level? Um, once we define the demographic and the and the purpose, that can inform the methodology, right? So if we're, if we're looking to reach out to youth for whatever reason, which aligns with maybe developmental priorities. So that also is, is another one where, you know, looking at other programs that may be focused on this issue and sort of, again, understanding what our priorities are from all those different lenses and then thinking about our advo advocacy campaign, if it's to youth, um, what do youth use in that in that um, you know country? Are they using WhatsApp? Are they using Facebook? Are they you know thinking about social media? If it's something you know a more mature audience, so um, defining all of those pieces, I think, um, is a really com critical component in answering the question. It just dawned on me now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this this is critical. So. The last part of the question does ask you, well, how would you advocate? And that's what Eve is going to. How would you advocate at the end of the day? And a lot of that, yeah. again, as Eve said, depends on, well, what's the issue? Who are you trying to reach? What's going on? But and remember, why are you advocating? And why are you doing it? But remember, you're not being asked to develop an advocacy plan in this question. You're being asked to demonstrate your intercultural proficiency. So your right. question, <laughs> so the answer that you give has to be from that perspective, right? So... In this, you'd have to say, well, coming from Canada, if I were going to be reaching a particular demographic, let's say, for example, youth, I would use this, 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 and this. However, it may be that in this context, I'm not sure whether the youth would be reachable the same way. So in order to advocate to them, I would have to keep in mind the cultural differences. And how would I find this out? This is what I would do. This is what I would use. This is what I would leverage in order to make sure that my advocacy plan reaches the right people in this cultural context, right? So it's not about the plan. It's about the competency. That's what you're focused on, right? Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so answer the question that way. There was a question or a comment in the chat saying, do we ever give the why of what we're doing? Yes, we do. And normally you summarize when you're doing your summary of well, what result you think would um, ha what result you think you would have after um, carrying out all of these actions, that's normally where you tie things back to what your role is, what your um, why you as an FS2 are engaging in all of this activity. Why? Because this is the mandate. This is what's expected of you as FS2. This is what's been assigned to you. This is what's necessary in order to further Canada's goals in such and such way. So that's where you pull together this why, right? That's where you give that. Go ahead, Andrew, do you have a comment or question? Oh, sorry, that was an old hand. <laughs> okay, I'm still looking in the chat now to see if there's some questions. CFSI, cultural coordinator, to understand more about culture, especially since you are new. Excellent, that's a very good point. There are resources that are available to you in terms of um, increasing your intercultural effectiveness. When you get to that proficiency in the questions, remember the resources that are available to you, right? Um, and then Susan has a comment as well, also to define what is the timeline? How much time do we have to develop this new approach? Excellent question. You'll notice as well in the question that the timeline is not given. Normally you arrive at post, normally around now, in the summertime is the normally the time when there's rotation. And what you can do is assume things that are to your benefit. It says that you've been given this task. Normally, you'd want to see some kind of movement on this in the fiscal year. So you can say, I assume I arrived at post in July. 
and that I have until the end of March next year to um, carry out some uh, advocacy plan, to develop the advocacy plan and, plan and, and implement it. That's the, the assumption that I'm making. So you can you can make that assumption because that helps you. If you only have an advocacy plan that you have to launch in two weeks, I mean that does not help you. That's a really short window. So if there's no timeline given, you can assume something reasonable that's helpful to you. Do you see? Does that make sense? Okay. Who else wants to give it a step? Who else wants to try to approach some of these um, elements of the question? Come, you've heard your colleagues do it. You can do it too. Come on, you can practice. Bez, do you have a comment yourself on what you've heard so far? Any advice for the uh, people on the line? Okay, first I have to learn how to unmute myself efficiently. <laughs> 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 but but first of all, why, why, thank you so much, CJ. This is fantastic. I think I learned more than I I can give back. <laughs> this, this is all good points. Of, but maybe if I can just, if. I, quickly go over some general uh, points if you want. Sure. Uh, full disclosure, I've been in the department for way too long and I've been on, 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 on um, I guess, selection panels. Uh, most recently, the FS3 uh, panel, which was using the base crews here and, and so on. Uh, that doesn't make me an expert. I probably, uh, you know, I don't know how, how well I would do in an FS2 exam right now. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% confident I would pass. Uh, <laughs> but just, <laughs> but just best, just uh, overall, I think you hit kind of major points uh, right on. Uh, the key is to really focus on the competency that's being asked in that question. And like you said, usually it's given at the top. So make sure that you know which competency is being asked and focus on that competency. Everything else is, you know, you don't get points for them. Uh, you could have the best strategy, the best answers, but if it's not related to that competency, it doesn't count as, as again, somebody who's on the panel. Uh, usually you're given kind of a key answer. You know, you look for things that you have to check and those are, you know, very few uh, and they only relate to the intercultural prophecy if, if in this example, for example. So anything else that you say, you, you could, I don't know, solve, uh, you know, a great uh, problem, uh, you know, war famine or something, but if it's not related to that <laughs> question, you get zero points for it. Uh, and also goes for, for kind of your own experiences. I think somebody was talking about how do, how do I talk, do I bring my own past experiences into this? Uh, Again, if it's not related to that question, you don't get points for it. What I see sometimes is people go on and their own experiences. This is what I did in this situation, and it just takes up too much time. And it doesn't doesn't really matter. You know, it, it's uh, you could have done the best job when you were at post, uh, but if you're not answering the question, you don't get the points. Uh, and also, uh, I guess related to that is uh, don't assume anything. If if you if you don't say it. You won't get the points for it. It was really uh, difficult sometimes to see candidates who, you know, they've done it, they know it, they really know it so well that sometimes kind of they jump a step. They don't mention how they got to that step, but you don't get the points. Uh, yeah. And I think that's probably more true uh, for things such as the, the knowledge uh, questions. Uh, I don't know if you kind of we're, we're coming to that later, uh, but the uh, uh, on this question, maybe just kind of a couple of uh, other kind of general tips as well too. This time is very short. Uh, it's going to go so fast, and you're going to be panicking. You're looking at the clock, and it's ticking and ticking, and then so um, the uh, it's good to take those notes. And when you actually talk, uh, again, in my case, as, as as somebody on the panel, I had no problem with people looking down at their notes. Uh, you know, don't don't think that you're kind of in a real interview talking to somebody live. You, you're not. So so if you if you you know if you need to go back to your notes and double check and make sure that you know you didn't forget something, it's better to do it that way than just talk and and miss something. Um, and the questions themselves, I would say that basically every word is there for a reason, not not to make you kind of too you know, I freak out too much, uh, but read it very carefully and see why they're saying this, why they're saying that. Every, again, every word is there for a reason. 
but at the same time, also don't worry too much if you don't cover 100% everything. Usually there's a scale, so if you need only above a certain point to pass, and and beyond that is basically kind of bonus points, which really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you, they don't. I don't think they expect you to get 100% on the, every question. Um, so so don't don't. I guess what I'm saying, don't don't freak out too much. If or don't get don't panic too much if you can't absolutely cover everything. Uh, to your points about there are multiple questions. Yeah, there are multiple questions sometimes. So you got to make sure that you answer every one of them. Uh, and sometimes how it works is if you kind of get two questions, but you don't say anything about the third question, it doesn't matter if you got 100% on the, the first two questions. If you got zero on the last question, you missed the whole thing. So, so super important to read each question. And even if you don't know, you know, the, the answer to the last question, try. Just <laughs> anything is better than nothing because, you know, the, these people on the panel can sometimes be generous and say, OK, yeah, we could. There's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, so you want to give them give them that. Don't don't hold anything back. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one of the questions in the chat. It says in answering these questions, what is the evaluator looking for? Are they ticking keywords from the competency dictionary? So from your perspective as as being on a panel, what is it that you had in front of you? What, what did you what were you looking for? So they you have a kind of an answer key. They tell you because they want to make them as consistent as possible. And there are multiple evaluators. Uh, you know, it's not just one person and they all they have second evaluators and so on. There's a whole process. So try to make it as consistent as possible. So, so they leave kind of little room for discretion. That's the idea in practice. I think there's a lot of discretion and flexibility as well, too, because everybody's different. But you have an answer key and you have to check every box. You know, did the person say this? And and you know, and it varies. Sometimes it's three to five, depending on the question. So you have to say those things to get the mark of that question. And like I said, you know, you you could go on and talk about I don't know how to solve word famine and have the best solution. But if it's not on the answer key that is in front of the evaluator, you don't get any points. Uh, and that's really related directly to the competencies, because uh, you know, again. Think, think about it from their perspective. How are they going to evaluate 400 uh, candidates? They want to make it kind of almost like as a, like a, I don't know, like a, as automatic or as, as kind of computerized as much as possible. So they want everybody to be able to uh, kind of uh, give the same answer and be evaluated the same way. And the only way they do it is based on the competencies. So really, uh, what I, what made my job easier was, you know, if the people actually referred back to the competency and said, this is the word, this is the word, like not to sit, you know, just throw it in there in your answer. And then, you know, ah, the person said this, upholds Canadian values, check mark. Check. Yes. That's it. So that's why, that's why it's important once you get the competency definitions, review them and then pull out key phrases from different points in the in the definition. And that's what you weave into your answer. Try to weave it in in a way that's somewhat natural. Don't be robotic, but try to pull that in so you make it easy for your evaluator to understand that, yes, this is a point that should be given to you. The and other thing is, well, is well, go ahead. Go ahead, Beth. Sorry. Right. I was just going to say on some, some, some of the questions, actually, uh, they it, it works the other way. Again, for, for knowledge-based questions, they don't want you to, to kind of memorize it. They want, they want you to be able to kind of apply it. Because uh, everybody can memorize, you know, the you know the top three priorities of the department, but they want you to be able to say how it relates to the question that they're giving you. This is the Canadian priority, and this is how it relates to what I'm kind of the question asks. Uh, to be able to go one step further, so it's not enough to just memorize the priorities, but you also have to think about how do I apply it to kind of my everyday job as an NFS two. Yeah, exactly so. Okay, and I told you as well that we would talk about signposting. This is the phrase that we use sometimes to talk about how to guide your evaluator through your answer, right? So we talked about that star format, but also within the star format, you start with your situation. So you start by saying, okay, uh, in this question, I'm presuming that I'm an FS2 at post, and, you know, and I'm presuming that you know this is my first posting abroad, 
um, and that I've been given this task, but that I have a predecessor and I have lots of colleagues. It's a big mission in a big country. These are the, these are the assumptions that I'm making. So this is the situation in which I find myself and the task that I've been given is to develop this advocacy plan in an environment that seems to me to be um, unfriendly and in a place where Canada's position is somewhat hostile to what, uh, depending on the, you know, the intercultural uh, clashes between the local population and Canada's uh, position on this issue. Okay, so this is an important issue for Canada. So certainly as an FS2 officer, we cannot fail to deliver the advocacy plan. We must, you know, promote Canadian values. That's part of my job as an FS2 officer because it's part of the mandate of the department. Right. The mandate of the department is to promote Canadian values. So I'm presuming that we are going to go ahead with this advocacy plan. But what I have to do if I'm going to be interculturally proficient is to modify the way in which I approach my job in order to make sure that, number one, I'm not offending the people that are around me. I'm not offending my interlocutors. The advocacy plan is actually effective and also so that um, Canada's values are indeed promoted at the end of the day. That's that's the situation in which I find myself. Okay, so the question asks me three things. This is the signpost. This is like being on the highway. You're on the highway, you see a sign, it says town one, next exit. And it says town two, you know, three kilometers. Town three, five kilometers, right? So that's what you do in your answer. You put your signpost. You say, this question is asking me three things. The first thing it's asking me is how I would develop an approach. The second thing it's asking me is how I would deal with the cultural reality, the jarringness of being in this new and seemingly unfr unfriendly culture, what strategies I would employ to manage this issue as an interculturally proficient FS2 officer. And the third thing it's asking me it's how I would advocate for Canada's position. So I'm going to deal with each one of those things in turn. The first thing is the um, developing the approach. Okay, so in developing the approach, what I would do is reach out to as many people as possible. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this. I talk to my predecessor, I talk to the LES, I talk to this LES, I talk to this person, I read through the previous materials, I listen to the uh, different social media, and I gather all of that information and I write something up that seems to harmonize everything and I give it to my manager and I have them review it. I uh, give it to headquarters and I have them review it because they're subject matter experts. And doing that should come up with an advocacy plan that should be effective and should take into account not only Canada's position, but also the local right? Do you see? So that's how I would handle that first question. The second issue that I talked about was the intercultural proficiency that I need to demonstrate in terms of adapting to a new environment. So the question tells me that the, the, the culture seems unfriendly. I'm going to assume that for the purposes of this question, that the culture seems unfriendly because there's a language barrier. So Based on this, one of the things I would do would be to try to take local courses in the language to strengthen my ability to communicate with people so that I could feel like I'm fitting in. I could feel more a part of it because part of being an interculturally proficient FS2 officer means changing yourself as much as possible to adapt to the situation in which you find yourself. And that's where you start pulling in language from the competency um, dictionary, from the definition in your answer right here. Here's where, if, as well, if you wanted to weave in an example from your life, you could say, you know, when I was working abroad before, one other strategy that I employed was to find out what was culturally important for the local uh, population. So what I found, for instance, was that this local sport that is not played very much in Canada was really quite important. And people followed the sport and they were very involved in the sport. So I started following the sport and I learned how to play it when I was in such and such country. So if that option were available in this situation, I would adopt that same strategy because I have found in the past that that's a way to connect with local people. And that makes a culture start to seem less unfriendly and start to seem more welcoming. That was my experience before. I would try to duplicate that strategy here for that. Right. 
then you move on. The third thing that the question is asking me is about how I would advocate for Canada. Well, I would do this, 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 and this, whatever it is. And, you know, I would adopt these strategies and I would look at it from this interculturally proficient lens. And at the end of the day, I would be a great success as a FS2 officer at the post. So that is how I would, from an interculturally proficient lens, approach the challenges that are presented to me in this question, because my job, of course, is to forward Canada's position while at the same time being respectful, respectful of the culture in which I find myself. Do you see? That is how you signpost what you're doing. This is how you set up and you guide your evaluator through your answer. If you just start giving lots of detail, your evaluator will get lost in your answer and will not know where to give you points for what, right? So you have to have a good structure you have to set out what it is that you're doing, and you have to guide your evaluator through your answer. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. Are there any further questions or comments? Does anybody want to look at the question some more? Do you want to look at other proficiencies or other uh, competencies? Do you want to look at other elements? Of course, we're having more sessions and we're going to record them as well. So those will be available to you. It is a lot to try to you know, go through, unfortunately. Uh, yes, it is. Very much so. Thank you for that question, Catherine. Um, is it recommended to prepare examples for each competent? What you should do is for each competence, read through each of the competencies once you get the definitions and think through how you would first of all demonstrate those competencies based on your own experience. Because some questions may be based on your experience. I'm not sure how they're going to come to it. Some will be hypothetical like this and some will be based on your experience. Who knows what they're going to give you, right? Or they might be um, hypothetical in the future to say, what would you do? Sometimes the knowledge of the department, as Bez was mentioning, the knowledge of the department question tends to be hypothetical like that. To say, okay, if you know that these are the priorities of the department in you know, this area, what would you do to further the department's mandate? You know, then now it's kind of wide open. And what you want to do is, for whatever competencies being assessed, you want to have a good understanding of what that means for you as an FS2 officer. And anything that you can bring to bear from your previous life, from your previous history, from what you're doing right now, that can help ex show that you exemplify those competencies, that's really helpful. But again, don't spend too much time on it. You have to weave it into your answer so that you don't just go totally far afield and end up spending five minutes talking about it. And now you don't have time to answer the rest of the question. Go ahead, Bez. Uh, just, just something you mentioned about the, the question that are based on your experience. Um, I think you, you got to keep in mind that they're asking you as an FS2. Uh, what I've seen sometimes is people kind of go on and give the answer that they think kind of uh, shows how much they've done and then kind of, you know, I did this, I solved this problem. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's not us. We recognize like the evaluators know that an FS2 in a kind of mission, I don't know, in Afghanistan, is not the person who's going to decide, uh, you know, what Canada is going to do in Afghanistan for the next five years. They want to know what you personally did in that situation. And I felt like some of the candidates in previous competitions, they missed that. You know, they kind of jumped at a step and they, they talk about the final decision, that which is sometimes, you know, is made. Uh, it's a political decision, ministers, or or who, what have you, but they don't talk enough about their own role. So it's really when th those questions, when they talk about your experiences, think about it as an FS2, not not kind of anybody else. And also, uh, again, as an evaluator, we take everything at that you know at face value. Um, so I think, again, even with those questions, it's important to uh, to keep in mind which competency they're looking for. Um, so, uh, so, so what we're really looking for is not kind of whether you succeeded or not, you know, in, in the example that you're giving, but how do you, in your answer, how do you meet the, uh, the competency that is being, uh, evaluated? Right. I don't know exactly. if that's clear. Yeah. It's all, it's all about that competency and it's all about you as yeah. an FS officer, right? That's Go ahead. It. It's not 
So sorry, sorry, Beth. Do you have something else? No, no. I'm just going to say, even those questions, not really about your experience. It's, it's about answering the the competency question. Right. Well, go ahead, Eve. Thanks. I'm mindful. I'm mindful we're we're uh, out of time. Um, just wanted to ask, in your experience at post as an FS2, how often should we be saying we're checking back in? We're checking back in, right? Like we're moving forward. This is our plan, and I'm checking in regularly with my manager. Or are we supposed to be more proactive? Like obviously we're not, you know, um, galloping off um, without consultation. But I just wanted to kind of do you, how as an at an FS2 level. When would you, like how much should we reiterate that we are checking in we at every step that you know what I mean? Yeah, to, to weave well, that into will, our at the FS2 level. Right, a lot will depend on the structure of the question. Right, so the question will sometimes give you a big problem. So certainly resilience and adaptability. It'll what will happen in a question like that is you'll have a plan. Some big obstacle will come in your way and will totally you know blow your plan out of the water. How do you adapt to that, right? And in that context, remember that you're an FS2, right? You're not the head of mission if you're at mission. You're not the director or the DG, right? So you're not the one making the call. Somebody like some at your level, you're expected to bring to your manager's attention that something has gone off the rails. And then to help your manager put your heads together as the, well, okay, how can we adapt? How can we change? What can we do? Certainly, again, when you look at a competency like judgment, well, you need to know where you fit in the organizational hierarchy. There are some things that were, you know, again, it's not going to be huge teams of people who report to you at the FS2 level. You may have an assistant. You may have some students. That's it. Aside from that, you report to most likely a program manager, a deputy director or a director, right? That's who you report to. And they need to be kept in the loop as to what you're doing. And they're, your, they're a resource for you. So when you're looking at those questions and so there's always going to be some challenge or some issue or something that has gone wrong or you're expected to do some work and it's really challenging. So as you go through, you're expected to know where to go in terms of pulling in resources that are going to help you accomplish your goal, right? So when you read through the definitions, there will be sometimes right in the definition, it says you follow instructions from senior management. You know, you talk to your colleagues. It says that in the definition of the competency at your level, right? So if it says that in the definition, you refer to it in your answer. Great, thank you. Go ahead, anybody else have any questions or comments at this point? Anything we haven't touched on that we wanna talk to? Okay, I'm just reading in the chat now to see. Um, asking for a colleague who couldn't attend the session, where can we find the recordings of these info sessions? My understanding is that the, um, the stream recording will come up as some kind of an attachment to this link. So if you were to go into this link before, it should come up as an attachment in stream. That's my understanding. Um, will the other sessions be looking at the same example or different competencies? We're going to look at different competencies as well. We're going to try to go through different ones. Um, another question here. Um, checking in and communicate with the people you consulted regarding status at each stage. I'm not, I don't understand the question. Susan, can you um, ex um, explain what you mean by that question? I'm not sure. Um, I was just wondering as an FS2, like in answering this question, um, do we, uh, do we need to say, well, so one of my actions would be, uh, well, after consulting with the local staff and uh, social media um, to uh, confirm that the, uh, confirm my assumptions that it is unfriendly, da, da, da. Um, do, do we need to mention how often we report back to the manager to say, well, actually, it is well founded that the locals are unfriendly and then, you know, check back with say my uh, predecessor and then, you know, just uh, report back instead of just, you know, when we ask them information, like we, at what point do we talk back or don't we need to? And how often do we need to do that? Sure. Remember not to get too far afield. You're not being asked to make a plan. You're asked to answer a question about your intercultural proficiency. That's the focus of your answer. So right. if you're talking about checking back in, you can address that very, very briefly. You can say, you know, you know, part of what I would do 
it, because I don't understand the culture very well and I've just newly arrived, I would speak with my manager and we'd establish some regular checkpoints over the course of the fiscal year. That's it, right? You don't need to get into the nitty gritty because you're not being asked to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Julia, should we focus on level two or three as well? What you want to get at least two, right? But look at two, look at three, look at four. If you start to see that they're getting a bit far afield, like into manager territory, it's beyond BFS2 level, right? But if you know that, you know, you can weave in something from the third column, you know, so much the better. But don't make sure you don't get tripped up and start answering from the perspective of the program manager as opposed to the FS2 officer. Okay, and mentor matching. Yes, people are still asking for mentors and I'm trying to pull everybody together and get information. I sent out a message asking for people to give me feedback. So I'm, I'm just collating that now. So I'm anticipating sending out the mentor matching tomorrow. Okay, any other questions? Anything else anybody else wants to raise or discuss in this session? Going once, going twice. That's it. Goes three times. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. Thanks, Thanks so much for everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you for participating. Thank you. There are more sessions, of course, this week. We'll look at different competencies. I'm asking the mentors to make up some more questions. Any question that you see, we've made these up, right? They, they're not coming from HR in any way. So I'm going to ask the mentors to make some up, and then we'll look at different competencies from those perspectives, and we'll try to walk through some of those so you can prepare as well. Awesome. Awesome. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much to everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, CJ and Beth. You're welcome. Bye bye.